Concepts like linear combination, span, and basis can feel abstract when you first meet them, but with a few simple examples in 3D and 2D, they become much easier to understand. In this video, we'll walk through the core ideas behind these terms so you have a solid foundation for the rest of linear algebra. Hey, I'm Oliver, a computer science student and tutor. I make short concept overview videos that help make maths and computer science ideas easier to understand. In this one, we'll look at a few essential linear algebra concepts and build the intuition you'll rely on as you go further into the subject. In case you're starting here, this video builds on my earlier video about vectors, where I break down what vectors are and how they work. So if you want a refresher on that, I suggest you check it out. First, we'll take a look at linear combinations, but before we do that, we will quickly go over the notation we'll use. In this video, vectors are notated with this arrow on top. So we have this vector vi, and we know it's a vector because of this arrow on top. And then we know this is a vector of size n because it is from our set of vectors that have entries from the real numbers and have a length n, where n is a natural number other than zero. So a positive integer in this case. Now, a linear combination would be a combination of different vectors in a linear fashion. What exactly does that mean? Well, linearly combined means that when we combine these two vectors, the only operations that are allowed are additions between the vectors and within the vectors, scalar multiplications. Formally, a linear combination can be written as such that we sum over all our vectors from i is equal to 1 to n, and in each step we multiply them by a scalar a1. In our simple case here, we would have had n be equal to 2, our a1 be 1 half, and our a2 be 2. We speak of linear dependence when we can write one vector as the linear combination of other vectors. In this case, we do not want our i, to be equal to j, since we care about the linear combination of all other vectors we have except for the one we're trying to replicate. If we can write this formulation, it means that our vectors v1 to vn are not linearly independent, and this becomes relevant a bit later on in this video. Next, we'll look at the span. The span is essentially just the set of all reachable points from the origin given a number of vectors. So in our case, when we are given this vector v, which is this vector here, the span of v, so written like this, is just the set of all points we can reach in the space through linear combination of the vector v. Since it's just one vector, we do not add with other vectors, but we just use scalar multiplication. Now, scalar multiplication, if you remember, does either a stretching or a shrinking of this vector. And in fact, if we have a negative scalar, it even reflects it so that the vector points in the opposite direction. Then our span for v is this entire line here. And it in fact goes on infinitely, but I have not sketched this in, just noted it with these dots. But now you notice that we do actually have these two dimensions and our line only has one direction. And this actually causes us to have some points in our space that are not on this line. And therefore, we cannot ever reach this point with our vector v alone. Now, if we add another vector, like this u here, we now have an additional direction we can move in. And the span of these two vectors would be our entire R2, so the entire space, so any point in the space, would be reachable by linear combination of these two vectors, since we can move in this direction and then in this direction as well. So if we wanted to reach this point here, we would move this far along our V and this far along our U. Formally, the span is defined like this. So we care about a set of vectors, our v1 to vn, and we ask ourselves, what are all the points we can reach 
through linear combination of these vi from 1 to n. And here our a1 or alpha1 is in the real numbers. They can be any scalar in the set. Now this is how you would write that using v and u we can reach every point. Because the r2 is this graph which we have here. It has two dimensions and it defines every single point in that space. But if we chose a different u, this would not have to be the case. If, for example, we chose this vector for u here, we see, sketched into this graph, it is just the opposite direction of this v. And that causes the span no longer to equal the r2. And formally, that this u points in the opposite direction of v is because this u and this v they are linearly dependent. You can write one in terms of the other. In fact, you can write v is equal to negative 2u. And this makes it very obvious that these two are linearly dependent. I want to briefly also show you an example in 3D space. It's a bit harder to see, but I'll try my best here. So here we have the origin, so our point where x, y, and z are zero. We have one axis which goes up here, like this, and which we do not directly see, and then two further axes here, which are defined by our vectors in this case. And the span of these two vectors is this plane here that you can see defined by these squares that goes all the way around here, but is not up here because we're missing one direction for our span in order to reach every point in the R3 space. So we see that in the R2 space, we can have a line as our span, and we can also have the entire space as our span. In fact, we can also have just the zero point as our span. That might just be a bit confusing, so I'll leave it out here. In our R3 space, we can again have the entire R3, we can have just a plane as it is here, or we can also have a line. For example, if we disregard this vector u and we just go along this vector v, then we have as the span a line in our r3. And again, we can also just have the zero. Now we saw that there's three different options for our r2 and there's four different options for our r3. For our rn, we have n plus 1 different options for our, how our span looks. We can have n different directions, in case we would just have the rn again. We can have n minus 1 directions, and so on, till we get to 1 direction and 0 directions. 1 direction being a line, 0 directions just being this point, and 2 directions, for example, being 2-dimensional space, so a plane. What I wanted to highlight here is that we always have different directions. So we're arguing over where we can get to, but also more broadly, which directions we can even use to get there. And this somewhat motivates the idea of a basis. A basis is the smallest set of independent directions that reach the whole space. If we are talking about the space Rn, we look for the smallest set of vectors v so that their span is rn and that all of these vectors are linearly independent. And linearly independent, as I've mentioned before, means that we cannot write any of these vectors as a linear combination of all the other vectors here. Essentially meaning that every vector gives us new information or rather, it gives us a new direction we can move in. If we look at these two vectors, v and u, which I've sketched in here, these are a basis of our r2. The reason for this is that combining them linearly allows us to reach any single point in this room, since these describe two directions. So, for example, to reach this point, we would go this far in this direction and then use our vector v to go into this direction. 
You can solve this by putting this into a linear combination and set it to any vector in our R2, and you'll see that you'll find alphas, so from our linear combination, the scalars, that satisfy this. Further, these two are linearly independent because we cannot write this vector in terms of this one. They describe completely different lines. And only if we add a third vector in this case would we get linear dependence. In this case specifically because if we already can reach the entire R2, so if these two describe a spanning set of our R2, that we can reach every point in R2. So adding any more points in R2 would cause the set of these three vectors to be linearly dependent. And just looking at V by itself, we can see that this is linearly dependent simply because we only have one vector. However, it no longer is a spanning set, so it doesn't satisfy the second condition because we can only reach points that are on this line. And for example, this point from our R2 is not reachable. This brings us to one last concept called the dimension. And our dimension is just the number of vectors in our basis. So in the case for our R2, we know that we need the second vector for it to be a basis. So we had this vector V and U. And since this builds our basis and has two vectors, our dimension would be two. So for our R2, the dimension is two. You can also think of the dimension as the number of directions that our space has. So for example, for our R3, this would be three, since we have our x, y, and z directions. And in fact, for any Rn, our dimension is just n. So Rn has n directions. So now you've seen how linear combinations build new vectors, how the span collects all reachable points by a set of vectors, and how a basis captures the essential directions in a space. If you want to see how vectors are used to define and solve systems of equations, check out my video on matrices, or check out this video recommended to you by YouTube's algorithm. Thanks for watching.